was the one who was like Great, we just got the text that Congressman's in the lobby, the staffers bring it in here. Do you want to announce that? Or is it like a... uh, why don't you go ahead and shut up you people? Hello. So we're going to be starting in just a couple of minutes. The congressman is in the building. So if you can sort of start winding down your conversations and maybe we can do housekeeping now and save some time, um, which means I'm telling you all to please do what I just did and turn off your cell phones. Thank you very, very much. And uh, I can give you some instructions. We're going to open this up to questions after some discussion from the podium. I will give you further instructions at that time. Um, and I think we will just get started in a moment.
All right. So we are going to call this panel to order. I don't know if we want to close the doors in the back as we get going. Thank you all for joining us this afternoon. Is it too loud? Am I shouting into this? I'm going to start singing in a moment. Um, my name is Lara Friedman. I am the president of the Foundation for Middle East Peace. It is my honor to be the moderator of this illustrious panel. Um, the panel today is going to look at America First or America Alone, looking at diplomacy and the State Department in the Trump era. And this is an issue that's close to my heart as a foreign policy wonk and as a former State Department um, Foreign Service officer. So this is quite personal, and I'm, I'm interested in the content here, and it's something that I'm very focused on. So we're going to get right to it, because we have three terrific experts um, and practitioners here to talk to us about the issues. I'm going to very briefly introduce them, and then we're going to have a set of short remarks. I think we're going seven to eight minutes, and possibly a little bit of discussion amongst the panelists as we wind that down. And then we'll open it up to Q&A from the audience. There's a microphone here in the center. At the time that we're ready to open it up, I will give you further instructions on what I mean by a cue, um, which is often not clear in panels. I've never understood that. Um, so with no further ado, um, so we're actually going to start, I'm going to do all the introductions first so we can have this go pretty, pretty directly. On my right is Nahal Tusi, who all of you who follow political reporting should know. She is one of, I would say, the most dynamic and wired reporters in Washington reporting on diplomatic affairs, the State Department, and with an eye to the foreign policy implications of all of that. If you don't read her, you should. To her right is Tom Countryman, um, who I know very well from my career in the State Department, an illustrious member of the State Department, senior uh, foreign service officer, U.S. official, served as assistant secretary of state for uh, international security and nonproliferation. And then to the right, but not to the right, um, we, we, we have Congressman Jerry Connolly. We are very honored from Virginia, who is with us today. So we are going to start off, I believe, with uh, Tom to talk to us about this from the perspective of what he's seeing with the State Department, his eye with his experience working within the State Department and the Trump administration, how it looks today. <clears throat> Thank you, Laura. I appreciate it. It was 2,500 years ago that the Roman army came up with an innovative management technique. Disobedient units were decimated. That is, every tenth soldier chosen at random was executed. Now, decimation has gone in and out of style over the centuries, but it's alive and well at the U.S. Department of State today. Uh, just take a look at the numbers. The total number of Foreign Service officers is down only by about 3%. But at the senior ranks, the effect of the Trump administration has been far more severe. The highest ranked career ambassador, equivalent to a four-star general, a year ago at the beginning of 2017, there were six. Now there are two. One who has announced his plans to retire, the other who is in exile at a university for having had the temerity to manage implementation of the Iran nuclear deal. The number of three-star equivalents has fallen from 37 to 20. The number of two-star equivalents, minister counselor, the rank I was at, has fallen from 470 to 370. If the same thing were happening in the military, if our top officers were leaving at that pace, dismissed at that pace, discouraged by drastic cuts in promotion numbers intended to send the clear signal that you have no future in the leadership of this department, we would term it a national emergency. And I think it certainly is a national emergency for the influence of the United States. Talk about budget for a moment. One thing, just a couple of facts about the budget. Historically, if you trace it in the last 70 years, as budgets have gone up and down, there has always been a pretty clear ratio of about 10 to 1, the size of the defense budget compared to the size, not just of the State Department budget, but of the entire foreign affairs budget, including operations of the State Department, the Agency for International Development, international assistance, including military assistance, about 10 to 1. The latest Trump budget proposals change that ratio to about 16 to 1. 
in favor of the military. The proposal is to cut the total foreign affairs budget from $55 billion, where it was in fiscal 2017, to $42 billion is the proposal from the administration this year, a 30% cut. And even more disturbing is the fact that operations are uh, becoming a smaller and smaller part of the budget. The operational side of the budget is generally broken down into core diplomatic functions and diplomatic security, that is hiring more guards, building new embassies, and building higher walls around existing embassies. That part, the diplomatic security part, has gone in even before this administration from about 16% of operating budget to 40% of operating budget. And the core diplomatic function that our embassies do on the ground every day, that number has been steadily declining since 2008. And today it is about 30% less than it was in 2008. The internal structure of the State Department is in turmoil, in part because of Secretary Tillerson's decision to reconfigure the department before asking either what was wrong with it or what were the goals of a new organization of the State Department. There's been an over-centralization of functions around the secretary himself and a lack of communication. I have some hope that Secretary Pompeo will be a better manager than Secretary Tillerson, although I have great doubts about his policy instincts and about his tendency to be not just a yes man to the president, but a hell yes man for whatever the president wants. The numbers are daunting, but I think what is of greater demoralizing effect in the Department of State today is the implications that they have for the United States' approach to the world. The U.S. is not simply leading from behind, to use a phrase that Republicans denigrated, but in fact, today the United States is leaving leadership behind. In all the areas that defined the American century, the last 70 years of relative peace and continued prosperity around the world, the United States was the leader in trade, in environment, in my field, non-proliferation and arms control, in human rights, in development, in global health. And in all of these areas, the United States is now stepping back. The U.S. has not always been consistent in its foreign policy, has not always lived up to its ideals, but it has, for the last century, behaved differently from any other hegemon in history. We often sacrificed our short-term narrow interests, whether economic or security, in order to build a world order that could make all nations more secure and prosperous. Our military protected us and reinforced that tendency, but it was enlightened diplomacy that led the way. Democratic countries and aspiring Democrats in non-democratic countries look to the U.S. for leadership and for inspiration. Now, in a time when the United States administration declares it's not bound by any kind of agreement that displeases it, we are falling back into a period where the United States is not just proclaiming our primacy, we're proclaiming that our interests alone are the sole factor of legitimacy in the international world. Others will fill the vacuum. I think of all the bizarre things that you could have seen in the last year, the strangest is to see the Chinese president wrapping himself in the mantle of free trade because the United States explicitly has dropped that standard. And finally, I'm concerned about the attack on morale that comes from the White House. In my view, the people around the president simply do not believe that there is such a thing as public service. Anybody who is smart, obviously, would go into law or real estate 
or some similar profession, and therefore those who have chosen public service must be of a lower caliber than those of us who have become millionaires on the outside. It's an insult, and if it were hurled at the people who serve the military for the same patriotic impulses that bring so many of us into public service, there would be an outrage. The State Department is not the swamp. And until we have the Congress willing to stand up, and there are very encouraging signs in this regard, and say that diplomacy is the less expensive way to promote our interests and our securities around the world, I fear for the continued decline of our diplomatic capability, the further decline of the respect around the world that we have enjoyed, and soon the near absence of leadership on the great challenges of the 21st century. Thank you. So thank you, there's a, a lot to chew on there. Um, I wanna pick up on where you left off, which is talking about the morale of the State Department and really the attacks on the State Department and its personnel. And I wanna go to, to Hallie, which is what her friends call her. Um, you know, there's been a lot with this administration, a lot of targeting of the civil service, um, including, and I will say, I, I became a foreign service officer. My consular commission was signed by a Republican um, president. And I know that if I were still in government, I would be called an Obama holdover. Um, how is this, how are you seeing this, this, this notion of targeting the foreign service, targeting public servants, and how does the management, the management style of this administration, how, how does an outside observer assess its impact on the performance of the State Department overall? Uh, well, first, first of all, thanks for having me here. It's, it's a pleasure and an honor. Um, I would, I want to just first of all make some very clear points. Um, a lot of you probably already know this, but there's such a thing as career government employees, right? These are civil servants, foreign service officers. They serve under any administration, and they're oath bound to implement the policies of whatever administration uh, is in charge. So if there's a Republican president versus a Democratic one, they're just supposed to follow the instructions, do their job uh, to the best of their ability. And it seems as if the Trump team didn't uh, you know, either have an understanding of this particular group um, or perhaps they didn't have an appreciation. In any case, in, in a lot of levels, especially when it comes to state uh, and, uh, for instance, the Environmental Protection Agency being another example, uh, they're just, they didn't have a lot of trust, right? So they came in uh, and they faced a number of factors that made them perhaps not as aware of what the foreign and civil service do as they could have been. One was that the administration, uh, there were just not a lot of Republicans that were willing to work for Trump, uh, especially when it came to foreign policy. You had the Never Trumpers group, for instance, who had signed these letters saying, no way, never Trump. And a lot of these guys were Republican, you know, foreign policy types from the neocons to the hawks to the whatever. Um, and so this group was automatically blacklisted by the Trump folks. Uh, you also, um, you know, had, uh, I would say, sort of a lack of preparation for the fact that the idea that they were even going to win. Uh, I think we can agree, you know, even Trump himself appeared to be surprised. Um, there is a sense in some quarters um, that uh, when it comes to the State Department that the administration in particular views it as a uh, democratic stronghold. Um, there's perhaps is some validity to that, <laughs> though not officially. Um, but that perhaps Trump also saw it as uh, Hillary Clinton's former stomping ground. And so there was this kind of hostility uh, toward that. Um, and then you also have kind of the anti, um, anti-government mantra of many Republican politicians. You know, I mean, this idea that government is too big, too bloated. Uh, so you have all these factors and they take over, uh, and they decide that state is one of those places, um, where they, they are, you know, going to cut, going to call, do whatever you call it. So uh, roughly a year, over a year ago, um, I started to see another aspect of all of this, which is really important to keep in mind, which is the conservative media's role in 
fanning some of these flames. Uh, I started to see over a year ago in places like Breitbart, the Conservative Review, and some other uh, sites, uh, that they were creating lists of what they called Obama holdovers. And now these are people who you know, were civil servants, foreign servants. They worked under Obama. Many of them worked under Bush. Many of them worked under probably Reagan even. Uh, but they were creating lists and circulating them on their website saying, these 10 people, by name, you know, they need to be fired. Uh, why has Trump fired, not, fired these people or hasn't fired these people yet? Uh, and this was very unusual. Uh, I mean, it's one thing to just have a general, you know, like, oh, government's bloated, whatever, but to actually target civil and foreign service people by name was pretty astonishing. So I started writing about this phenomenon, um, and along the way, you know, I encountered the story of this one woman, um, a career civil service officer who joined uh, under the Bush administration, the second Bush administration, and, um, she uh, is of Iranian descent, although she was born in America. And uh, because of her background and history and knowledge of the language, et cetera, and just her career, uh, she had uh, been tapped to work on the Iran nuclear deal under Obama. So of course, she was on this list of people that the conservative media uh, said that you know, people should be uh, booted. And it was just extraordinary, the, the messaging and how, um, how quickly people in the Trump administration seemed to simply believe what they were reading in the partisan press. And I personally, like, I, I am not from a partisan press outlet, and I've always been really careful whether it's left or right. You know, whenever I read something from Mother Jones or, or Breitbart or whatever, I always take it with a grain of salt. I'm like, okay, I have to remember where they're coming from, and I have to do my diligence and check the facts. Uh, but it seemed like people who uh, were in the administration or conservative supporters on the outside, such as Newt Gingrich, et cetera, um, they didn't really do further research. They just read these things and believed them. And so they were like, my God, you know, you have these moles, uh, these Obama holdovers, uh, and why are they still in the administration? So this brought pressure, additional pressure, on the administration to target some of these people individually. And in the case of this one woman, um, she was reassigned out of her position at the State Department three months before her detail was up on what was known as the policy planning, planning staff. And um, it was apparently in contradiction to her memorandum of understanding. There was no real reasoning behind it. She had reached out to her um, boss, uh, a political appointee, and said, look, the stuff that's being reported on about me is not true. They're saying I was born in Iran. I wasn't. They're relying on Iranian state media <laughs> to characterize me. That's not a good, reliable source. Uh, but her protests went unheard. So that was just one example. And just to be clear, uh, just a few weeks ago, I got a bunch of emails um, that detailed these conversations that people like Newt Gingrich and others had about her in convincing the administration to move her out of her position. Uh, so that can, you know, it, that sort of thing has very much damaged morale. It has put people on edge within the civil and foreign service. They, they just feel like they are being unfairly targeted, that they are being unfairly stereotyped, and they're just trying to do their job. And so one manifestation, for instance, of how unhappy they are morale-wise is that they're talking to people like me, people who, seriously, like more than you know, a couple of years ago, they would never have considered even talking to a reporter, but now they are. So that's just, that's uh, one way of thinking about it and looking at it. Thank you. And I would add, this is specifically, we've seen this targeting of people who work on the issues that a lot of us in this room care about, um, with people at the NSC who work on Israel-Palestine, who were holdovers, these are civil service and foreign service, and on Iran in particular. So I want to turn it over now to Congressman Connolly to give us the view from the Hill. And uh, Tom Countryman talked about the responsibility of Congress to intervene and the hopeful signs that we're seeing. So we're hoping you can give us insight and also some rays of hope. No pressure. What was that last one again? <laughs> well, first of all, let me just say I am an Obama holdover. <laughs> I actually believe in a rational and coherent foreign policy. And I know that makes me an outsider. Uh, secondly, let me just say how gratified I am to see this crowd. Um, it's wonderful. And J Street is doing an incredible job of creating some political space to have a debate about our role in the Middle East and uh, the future of Israel. And I think those are both really good things. 
So thank you all for being here in such numbers. It's great. Um, let me let me back up a little bit. Um, <clears throat> you got to remember that there is sort of, if you want, a, an intellectual framework to what we're witnessing with respect to foreign policy and, and, and why we're seeing neglect and evisceration at the State Department. And it comes from Steve Bannon and Breitbart. Um, their belief is strong that the United States, we, we need to disengage. We, well, because if we don't, from their point of view, we're, we're going to end up in a shooting war over Estonia. And that makes no sense. That's part of a NATO obligation. And, and therefore, the traditional instrumentalities we built after World War II that have worked for a long time, that won the Cold War, and, uh, and have promoted democracy, are suspect and need to be abandoned. Entanglements like multilateral trade agreements need to be renounced. Uh, even armaments agreements need to be re-examined, if not renounced. And so, he found a perfect vesicle in which to pour this intellectual content <laughs> with Donald J. Trump. And, of course, the Trump added one special thing to Bannon's philosophy, and that was, I love Vladimir Putin. Having a relationship with the Russians is a good thing. So, what happens? We have a candidate, Donald Trump, who says the Iran nuclear agreement needs to be ripped up. That uh, TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership uh, Treaty, needs to be renounced on day one. NAFTA needs to be ripped up and renegotiated. Uh, he disparages NATO and the European Union quite vociferously during the course of the campaign, all egged on by Steve Bannon. And when they actually win the election, they set about to implement this philosophy. So there's a context to all of this. And it isn't that they downplay foreign diplomacy, they actually have contempt for it. It is not an accident that the State Department has experienced what it's experienced. And I, I wanted to add to Tom's numbers. So, I mean, just to think about this for a minute, what I'm about to tell you, what, 15, 16 months into a presidency, um, the number of Americans applying for the Foreign Service exam has dropped 33 percent in one year. Uh, new entry foreign service officers have dropped from 366 in the last year of the Obama administration to 101 this year. 50 percent of the most senior career leadership of the State Department, career ambassadors and career ministers, have in fact departed. 50 percent. Uh, we don't have ambassadors uh, in South Korea, Turkey, Yemen, Jordan, the European Union. The coordinator for our efforts in North Korea has resigned. We don't have a Secretary of State. 38 ambassadorships are vacant. Only one of seven undersecretaries has been confirmed. And eight of 22 assistant secretaries confirmed or 14 still vacant. This is a hollowing out of our diplomatic capacity. I was in North Korea when we had, I mean, uh, Korea when we had uh, one of the early missile crises. Uh, remember we were sending the aircraft carrier off the coast to show them, except it went in the wrong direction. We did not have an ambassador in Japan, an ambassador in South Korea. We didn't have an assistant secretary. Mike Pence had to do it. Um, so we see a conscious retreat from the world. And here's what's so disturbing to allies. 
it isn't just the abrogation or renouncement of treaties and agreements. These are things we initiated. You can argue the merits of free trade. I happen to support free trade. But to walk away from the TPP, that was our agreement. We left, you know, 11 states abandoned, and we created a vacuum that Beijing loves, and they are still drinking champagne. The Iran nuclear agreement, we brought Russia and China and Iran and the Europeans to the table and, and forged an agreement after having successfully coordinated sanctions. And that agreement, every metric in that agreement has been met. Centrifuges, enriched uranium, the, product, uh, the plutonium production reactor, inspections, all the dire predictions of what was going to happen were proved false. Netanyahu called the agreement itself an existential threat to Israel. He could not be more wrong then and today. And if... And if the president follows through on his threat, you will get a nuclear Iran. And I don't know what credibility we will have moving forward to ever bring those kinds of parties to the table to trust our leadership and our word and our commitment to our own agreements. That's the chaos of Steve Bannon and his influence even now on U.S. foreign policy. Now, add one more thing the unbelievable erratic of the very stable genius in the Oval Office. <laughs> so one week he says, I want to get out of Syria and I want to do it fast. And the next week he's declaring total victory, having launched uh, targeted attacks on uh, chemical weapons storage facilities in Syria and declaring it a complete victory. And I guess now we can leave again. Now, there could have been, some people say, uncharitably, I'm sure, there might have been a connection between his announcing he wants to get out of Syria and Assad's willingness to use chemical weapons a week later. Just saying. So, we don't have a stable leader. I mean, we could spend the whole rest of this seminar talking about examples of that. Maybe you'll take it in faith. He's not stable. <laughs> he certainly is erratic. Uh, you know, we're going, he's going to meet with Kim Jong-un. Absolutely no thought. And, and what Tom and, and Nahal were talking about, God, do we need a diplomatic uh, uh, presentation and analysis before you commit to meeting with Kim Jong-un? What could go wrong with that? I'm prepared. Uh, and uh, no thought went into it at all. He just spontaneously went into a room with South Koreans and said, I'll go. I'm going to meet with him. We don't have the team in place. We certainly don't have clear goals. We don't know that we're protecting the president. I know what Kim Jong-un gets out of that meeting. Not clear what we get. That's good. And that, those are the dangers. So this isn't by accident. It is deeply troubling because diplomacy can deter conflict and does all the time. And the instrumentalities we work so hard to create, imperfect though they are, have served us very well since World War II and have, in many cases, minimized or eliminated the possibility of conflict. And so... It's, a, it's not only a troubling world, we're making it more difficult. We're making conflict more inevitable. Uh, and we are retreating from our position in the world, which we must carry because of who we are. And so I don't think you can overstate what this represents. It isn't just they don't like a particular bureaucratic department of government. It's far more sinister. It's deliberate, it's by design, and it's based on a, a, a very uh, dystopian view of the world, frankly, and our role in it, uh, best articulated by Steve Bannon. And his ghost, believe me, continues to haunt 
the White House. Thank you for having us here today. Okay, so we're about to open up to questions. There is a microphone in the middle. I ask you to line up. I will try to go boy, girl, boy, girl if you uh, actually get up there and there's boys and girls. Otherwise, I'll call on whoever's up there. I ask it to be in the form of a question that starts with an interrogative. It ends in a question mark, and it's not more than really one or two sentences. But before I, I'll call on you, so start lining up. I actually want to do two follow-ups very quickly. Um, First, Congressman Connolly, Congress. I want you to just address briefly the role of Congress in pushing back and trying to push back. And then I'm gonna ask the question now. Tom, I want you to talk very briefly, and I'll think of something for you, very briefly, on the question of what this hollowing out means for the longer term. Because people are thinking about it in immediate numbers, but the Foreign Service is a system where people move up the ranks. And the hollowing out that's going up, going on right now at the middle to mid-senior level bodes very ill for the future, meaning that even if you had a shift in policy, you would not be able to change course immediately and get us back on track. So you two go very, very quickly so we can open to questions. So um, in some ways, uh, unlike almost all other ways, the Republicans in Congress do have some trouble with this foreign policy. So they have... Uh, we have uh, fought back on the budget. In fact, we didn't take the 32% cut in state and aid seriously at all. It was never considered. But that doesn't mean individual programs won't be hurt. We're fighting right now for the National Endowment for Democracy, for example. So specifics are still vulnerable. Um, filling vacancies would play very little role, nor have there been loud voices saying what is going on on the Republican side of the aisle. On the Russia relationship, I would say most members of Congress on both sides are very uneasy about where this president and this White House want to go on that and have shown some resistance. Uh, the problem is by having Trump articulate what he articulates, it, it does magnify the pro-Russian voices, not that there are many of them, but nonetheless, they were, they were totally marginalized until the 2016 election. Now they have standing. And and, uh, and and that alone changes dynamics. Uh, but I would say most members of Congress are very uneasy about that, don't trust it, and most of them are going to do what they can to reassert, you know, uh, our concerns about Russia on a long line. Now, we're mi you know, we're missing one important voice, John McCain, in that regard. Uh, he, he has outsized influence on that, and not having him here... Uh, is, is a terrible loss. Um, so I, I, I would say those two things, Congress is doing right. But you have seen this Congress, uh, the Republicans are, are have, have essentially gone AWOL. They see and hear and speak no evil when it comes to Donald Trump. And therefore, you can't count on them. And that's why, and I don't mean this as a partisan the only solution is the Democrats have to win in November and take back the House of Representatives. And, and if I may, why is that important? Unlike the Senate, in the House, majority control is absolute. The minority has almost no rights. If we're in the majority, we control the hearings. We control the witnesses who come to those hearings. We control investigations that are undertaken. We control what subpoenas are issued. We control what bills come to the floor and what amendments, if any, are allowed. That's the power of the majority. And I assure you, with respect to foreign policy, there will be vigorous, relentless oversight should that prospect be materialized in November. Oh, man. Um, when we again have a stable, rational president, uh, the State Department will recover, the Foreign Service and the Civil Service. Uh, there remain dedicated individuals who have taken an oath to defend the Constitution against all enemies, foreign and domestic, and who take seriously their obligation to serve the president, to serve the American people, to serve America's best interests. Yeah. It does mean that people will rise faster in this hierarchy, which is a genuine meritocracy. Uh, but in the meantime, again, if you want to use a military parallel 
to remove 50% of your most experienced officers during a crisis time, somebody will fill that job, somebody with less experience. They may do just as well, but you are taking a risk. And that risk will remain not just for the rest of this four-year term, but for some time afterwards. I think in the longer term, the danger is what the rest of the world comes to expect from the United States. If I could quote the Secretary of Defense, Jim Mattis, and by the way, whether you're religious or not, every night you should say a prayer for the health of Jim Mattis. Uh, uh, he talks about the power of inspiration or the power of intimidation. And more and more, what this administration is teaching Americans and teaching the world is that the U.S. intends to rely on intimidation rather than inspiration. That will not be as rapidly reversed as the damage, the organizational damage, the institutional memory damage that's being done right now. Okay, and my last question very quickly to Holly Pompeo. Not yet secretary, it's an open question, seems likely. Um, what do you see the effect of Pompeo being at the, at the State Department being going forward? Uh, well, if he gets to the State Department, and that really is an open question right now. Um, uh, I think there's certainly a lot of hope that he's going to be a better manager than Tillerson. During his uh, confirmation hearing the other day, he made that basically like two of his top three priorities is to discuss how he was going to have a culture of openness there, how he was going to rely on the civil and foreign service officers, how he wanted to make the State Department uh, get its, quote, swagger back again. Uh, and he said that he talked to so many people who felt demoralized. So he really did seem to make that a top priority. He also told Congress that he wants to fill a lot of these vacancies, especially in the leadership positions, um, and that he wants Congress to help him on that. Now, I still think that simply due to logistics, um, that it could take a long, long time before a lot of these top positions are filled. Uh, and what Pompeo might find uh, is that he might want to do a lot of the stuff. He might want to bring in a bunch of people. But one of the biggest obstacles in his way, and Tillerson found this out too, um, was the White House, because the White House is often the one that's turning down uh, the potential nominee. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to, a word of caution. Most members of Congress couldn't manage their way out of a paper bag. <laughs> Most of them have trouble managing their own offices, which are 10 or 12 people. The reason for that is because, unfortunately, the, 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 the way you get promoted to Congress usually, that the route is through your state legislature, where you also don't manage anything. Very rarely do people, I happen to come up with through local government, where I managed a big local government, but most of my colleagues have never managed anything. And so when you promote them to a cabinet position, it's a brand new world. Some of them do well, some of them tragically do not. Most of them don't do all that well. So putting a lot of hope on Pompeo to be you know, the antithesis of Rex Tillerson, maybe, maybe his time at CIA has you know given him some tools, but I would, my word of caution would be don't get too excited about it because most of these guys don't know how to manage an enterprise. Thank you. Okay, we have about 25 minutes. So we're going to start at the first person in line. Identify yourself. Say who you're asking the question to, and then your question, please. His name is Bruce Waxman. <laughs> there should be a little button on the mic that you can push up. Or plug it in. You can take mine. Or that. Uh, sure. I got faith in you. How's that? Uh, thank you, Jerry, for introducing me. <laughs> so um, my question is is going to veer off a little bit, and it may seem bizarre, but I think some of you have alluded to it. Well, uh, and this question is possibly just to Ms. Tuzzi, but maybe not. And Larry, you'll decide. So um, not too long ago. I had a conversation with someone I know fairly well. Our politics are quite different, but this has to do with the hollowing out and the Steve Bannon and all. And I try not to discuss politics with this person, and you'll tell from my question why. So she brought up to me, well, don't you know about the deep state? And um, my answer was no. Um, you know, I know there's coal mining in West Virginia, but I wasn't sure that's what she had in mind. 
Um, but uh, so I think I know what this thing is, but I'm not completely sure. And I don't know whether this is a factor because you mentioned this uh, attack on this Iranian woman and other things. Um, does this play into this at all? And if so, could you explain this to some of us who don't quite grasp this? So, Heli, can you translate the, war the term deep state for a progressive audience and explain what is going on here? Okay, so I used to work in Pakistan where I came to believe there actually is a deep state. Uh, but that's usually the sense. Uh, it's the belief that uh, the people who are politically elected or who seem to be in charge really don't have the power and that there's a combination of a uh, military slash um, sometimes corporate, uh, sometimes, I guess, diplomatic to some extent, a group of people who are running things behind the scenes and who really uh, control the actual levers of power and can make things happen uh, that can keep uh, political uh, leaders from accomplishing their aims. Uh, now, this was, I, I don't exactly know who brought this into the lexicon. Was it Bannon or, uh, you know, for, for the U.S.? Yeah. Um, and look, look, here's the thing. There's no question that the bureaucracy in the U.S. government has a lot of power. Uh, but this notion that there is this, like, coordinated conspiracy uh, within this bureaucracy, it's a little hard to believe because it's just so vast and not particularly well coordinated on a lot of levels. Um, so, but one of the funny things that I, I read, it was a profile of Tillerson in one of the magazines that they, this one former Foreign Service officer said, well, you know, there wasn't a deep state before, but these idiots have managed to create one. Um, and so there is this sense now that, you know, there are people through leaks, et cetera, uh, who are trying to change the way uh, this president and this administration operate. It's also a convenient argument to manufacture a deep state to absolve yourself of responsibility when the legal system says you've done something wrong, or the intelligence community comes up with a conclusion with which you do not agree. Um, so I'm going to pitch a hypothetical, and it's that we make it through the next two years, and there is a future. Can you identify yourself? Oh, yeah. Huh. Uh, my name's Maura. I'm a sophomore at IU, uh, Indiana University. Um, and while Ms. Tusi, you are one of my favorite reporters at Politico, my question is actually for Mr. Countryman. Um, you touched on it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you touched on earlier how we're going to have to go about repairing uh, the outside perspective of the U.S. And um, I know there's a lot of talk about just going back to normal, but do you think that's going to be enough? Um, just going back to normal, or are we going to have to have like proactive, coordinated efforts to go about and say sorry for the past four years or anything that has come from it? Um, that's a tough one. Uh, Going back to normal means going back to chaotic. The world is chaotic, and the best efforts of the best diplomatic service in the world, the U.S. Foreign Service, cannot solve every problem around the globe. The difference is that traditionally we have been viewed by friends, whether they are democratic countries or democratic leaders in authoritarian states, as actually trying to make the world more open, more transparent, more free, and more prosperous. Uh, the current administration is doing everything possible to damage that image of the U.S. acting not just out of selfish self-interest, but in the interest of a, a greater good. Uh, I think we can get back to a position where the rest of the world sees us as having that mission as being not just the same as Russia or China, but actually having an ins inspirational leadership role. It will become more difficult with every agreement that this president tears up. Uh, I have no idea how he believes that tearing up the Iran agreement makes it easier to get an agreement with North Korea. Uh, but uh, the amount of damage that's done in these four years will be, I think, proportional to how long it takes us to recover our standing in the world. Just last point, uh, you have a laundry list of uh, mendacious statements made by this administration, but the one that always outrages me the most, and it's one of the vice president's favorite lines, is to say the U.S. is more respected than ever. Bullshit. We have never That's had less term, respect. Though. Yeah, but I used it a lot even before I retired. 
Uh, <laughs> the we have we have never been less respected around the world, and that's a fact. Hi, my name. Is Go ahead. Hi, my name is Bennett. I'm a student at Columbia University. Um, I wanted to ask, you've been talking a lot, and this kind of piggybacks off of the last question as well. Um, you've been talking a lot about the hollowing out of the State Department and filling that gap. Um, and speaking as a young person in the room, and I'm sure that there are many other young people who feel similarly, um, we're going to be the people um, who are filling those gaps. Um, I think that there are a lot of people, particularly people in this room, um, who would maybe love to work in the State Department one day, um, but not this State Department. Um, for some pretty obvious reasons. Um, and I think that there's a growing culture as well um, of not wanting to be complicit in what we see as really serious moral damage to the fabric of our country. Um, how would you recommend going about navigating the desperate need to fill these vacancies in the State Department and also maintaining some semblance of moral integrity um, under this administration? Well, thanks. That's a topic I talk about a lot. I did it just 10 days ago up at Columbia where my sons are. Uh, and despite the fact that I'm no longer in the government, uh, I encourage young people to go in to the Foreign Service and to the Civil Service at this point. And I can't make you comfortable if you're concerned about complicity, but I can offer two countervailing points. One, you are far less likely to face a moral conflict in the job you're doing when you're at the bottom of the pyramid, when you have a very specialized task that could be as routine as issuing visas. Uh, you're not going to have the same moral conflicts. And two, uh, what's happening in the State Department right now has led to a lot of what the military calls battlefield promotions. Uh, and that is, the commander is killed, you step up a rank. Uh, not to be cynical about it, but the fact is the people who are there now at the tough times are the leaders tomorrow. And it's not only that I hope people will continue to go into the Foreign Service and the Civil Service, it's also I want the good people who are there to stay. A few hours from now, I'm meeting a former employee of mine, an incredibly knowledgeable and valuable guy, who is out of the department for one year on a fellowship and wants to talk to me about, should I go back? It is more comfortable outside. And I'll do my damnedest to tell him to stay. Uh, until you reach not just a point where you're uncomfortable and feeling a little bit complicit, but a point of a genuine moral conflict, I urge these terrific public servants to stay. Um, and I would just like to add that if any of you are planning on joining the Foreign Service, I have business cards that I would like to give you so that once you join, you can be wonderful <laughs> sources for me. Thank you. Can, can I just add, I, in an odd way, I think Steve Bannon would be very happy with your statement. He would love to hear that good people like yourself are discouraged and won't even try. That's part of their goal. And so I, I think it's, I think though it's difficult, I echo what Tom said. Now's the time for good people to actually go in. Counter this and preserve your integrity. Bring it with you. It's desperately needed. Thank you. I'm going to add something as a moderator, but, but as an ex FSO who went into the State Department in a, under an administration that wasn't the party that I am naturally supportive of, that's irrelevant. The, the serving your country matters and, and everything people have said here. It is so important for the moment and for the future and for all of us probably know people who are now every day going in and facing that moral conundrum question. You have to be pretty senior to face that and then every day you got to look yourself in the mirror and make that decision. But if you can stay in and serve your country, then you do and it matters and it's important and I, I hope people won't be discouraged. All right, next up. Hi, my name is Sadie, and I'm a junior at Oberlin College. Um, I'm hoping we can talk about the America First mentality and contextualize it a little bit in terms of certainly the uh, current Trump administration, but also what we've been seeing from the Republican Party and Republican leadership um, before 2008. So um, 
this is a question directed to all three of you, but is this, you know, is that part of the foreign policy? Is this really that new? Um, or are we seeing a escalated, trumped up version of what's been pushed by conservative media and conservative leaders for years? Well, maybe I'll take a crack at it first. I mean, I suppose it depends on your perspective. There are other countries in the world, other people in the world who would say, what's new about that? America's always put itself first. But I think that cheapens our history. I think there have been, you know, Churchill called, for example, the Marshall Plan the least sordid act of any nation in history. His way of saying a generous act by the Americans. Um, we cre created in international uh, uh, agencies and entities that stabilized world finance, that promoted democracy, that created a world forum to try to avoid conflict. We created peacekeeping forces to try to enforce uh, agreements and so forth. These were not putting America first in the way I think Trump means it. These were these were not sorted acts. These, you know, yeah, our self-interest is there, but we did it in a collaborative way. We empowered others. We, uh, you know, we helped with a, a foreign assistance program that lifted hundreds of millions of people out of poverty, dire poverty. Um, and and so, uh, isn't it isn't it the goal of of our foreign policy to promote our values and to promote democracy because democracy is empowerment. And we believe those values are universal. They're not unique to America or to our culture. And, um, and I think when Trump says America first, it in many ways is to be interpreted as a negation of all of that. And uh, it's a very ugly concept, to be honest, uh, here and abroad. Um, and uh, really uh, an episode, I hope, will be a one-time thing that we look back on saying what a mistake that was. To agree with everything the congressman said and then take it in just a slightly different angle. Uh, those countries that are natural rivals or even adversaries of the United States, including China, Cuba, Russia, et cetera, Iran, uh, would say there's no difference. It's always been America cynically self-interested. The difference is that the United States has had allies. We have dozens of allies around the world. It's not because we, we didn't get Western Europe and the Russians got Belarus and Syria because we got to pick first. We have allies because we stand for something. And when we go to the lengths of saying America first to the disparagement of our allies' importance their security, their economic interests, it is how you lose allies. And even the earlier neocons who had, as you referred to it, an earlier version of America First, never pictured doing it without allies the way that the White House wants to do it today. And, and if you just think about it for uh, one more, politically, even an ally, let's take Trudeau of Canada, he can't afford to be seen like a toady that everything he does with us is promoting America first, not Canada first. It, it, it's, it's, it's not a tenable proposition for allies, for other leaders from their own domestic political point of view. I can add it. It also suggests why there is such a disconnect between this administration and the State Department, I think, because one of the foundations of foreign policy, and this is a fact-based foreign policy, says Enlightened self-interest is grounded in the idea that when we inspire, when we engage, when other people like us and believe in what we stand for, we will have better relations in the world and we will be able to better promote our self-interest. And that runs completely against the grain of this administration. So, okay, so next up. Hi. Uh Name is Mitchell Plitnick. I've been, uh, I'm currently a journalist and have been uh, involved in journalism and advocacy on um, foreign policy issues for about 20 years. My question really goes to everybody, um, but I'm glad that we have people who have a real experience in both the legislative and executive branches because that's kind of what I'm asking about. Um, this administration certainly makes me, and I'm sure I'm not the only one, feel like we've gone along for a long time with certain norms of how a president behaves. 
and this president ignores those in a way that I would have to say no president has before. And so it makes me question the system that we're, we're working under where um, foreign policy can be largely carried out by the executive branch. Um, you have an executive who can basically push Congress to a certain degree to the side and maybe, you know, so it raises the idea that maybe we should strengthen the role of Congress uh, in foreign policy development and execution. The other side of that being that Congress, uh, by design, is more susceptible to, uh, you know, pressure groups, special interests, et cetera, that might, um, <clears throat> excuse me, might push our foreign policy in ways that a more sober analysis might not go. So how should we respond? Should we just hope that things go back to normal when Trump is gone? Um, and, and just assume that no one like him is ever going to come into office again? Or should we take some steps to make sure that no future president can do what he's doing? Well, I agree with you that Congress should have more of a role right after November. Um, what is one of the sad parts of being in this Congress right now is where are the heroic Republicans? I mean, I'm old enough to remember Watergate. There were a plethora of uh, Republicans who spoke out but long before the smoking gun tape, put their, line, their careers on the line. Some of them suffered. The current governor of Maryland, his father, Larry Hogan, was on the impeachment panel. He voted for it. It hurt him. Caldwell Butler, a Republican from my state in Virginia, it hurt him, but he did it because they put country ahead of partisanship. Um, we don't see those or hear those voices today. Um, I, don't, I don't know that we can ever again um, luxuriate in the thought that Trump is a one-off and we'll never do that again. The fact that it could happen at all tells us that we're going to have to do some re-examination of the norms and the restraints on the executive. Um, but we also need to think about how reliant that legislative branch is because we're not doing any oversight right now. I'm on the oversight committee as well as the House Foreign Affairs Committee. We don't know nothing about Russia or conflicts of interest or the security clearance problem at the White House or the hollowing out of the State Department. I mean, we haven't had a hearing on any of it. We're the oversight committee. <laughs> I mean, well, any anyway, rate, uh, so there's an institutional breakdown all of us have to be concerned about, and there's got to be repair both in the executive and legislative branch as we move forward. Right up the street at the National Zoo, you can go to the invertebrate house, but you can see the same thing on Capitol Hill. Uh, and the answer to making the, the Congress again, a co-equal branch, is to empower them. And that happens in November. I'll, I'll just add something very briefly. <laughs> um, sometimes I really wish I was allowed to have an opinion, but I'm not, because I'm a reporter. Uh, but I will say that, you know, I think it also shows the importance of organizations uh, that, you know, operate in the civic sphere, uh, and the importance, like like yours or, or other groups, um, and also the importance of the media. And one of the most like wonderful things that I thought happened, you know, after the election was there was just this huge spike in the number of subscriptions to uh, major newspapers in this country because uh, they realized that the media uh, needs that kind of support to be able to do the important investigative uh, reporting on these issues that the House Oversight Committee apparently knows nothing about. Uh, so, you know, I, I just want to say, you know, don't just because you're not in Congress or you're not in the executive or whatever, that doesn't mean you can't make a difference as an individual. All right, we have a little more time left. Next up. Oh, okay. Yes, so my name is um, Toby, and I'm a student from Minnesota. Um, so my question is for everyone. Um, I'm, and I'm asking this question for everyone in the room, especially the young students who are thinking of a career in the civil service or in foreign service. So my question is, what does it take to be a diplomat? And what qualities must a diplomat have? Because when I think of diplomacy, I think of extra intelligent people, people who have high air, people who are making decisions for their countries and people who are like held very accountable and they have to they have to do a very good job or else people are not gonna like them. So what do you think it takes to be a diplomat and what advice do you have for us? The question is what does it take to be a diplomat? Young people looking at this today. 
Well, there's a, a disconnect between the uh, selection process and the actual skills. In brief, the selection process requires you to take a very difficult test that tests all kinds of knowledge. And if you pass that to do a, and about 10% of the people who take the test pass that, and out of that 10%, uh, maybe 20% pass the next stage. Uh, and it is meant to measure your general knowledge, intelligence, your ability to think on your feet, your ability to speak and to write eloquently. Uh, it's a good profession because it means everybody in the Foreign Service is of fairly high intelligence. You don't have to work next to a bunch of idiots. And that's, uh, there's not many professions where you can say that. Uh, well, so that, well, Congress. Well, yeah, I, I was not going to say that. The, the, um, uh, it does not have a way to screen out at the beginning future megalomaniacs and assholes, but it does mean you have fairly intelligent people. Single most important skill for a diplomat and a reason that diplomats are not respected by this White House, most important skill, the ability to listen. Yeah. But by the way, just I'm going to comment on Tom has twice used words that I wish I had used. One of the lessons that I learned when I was a young diplomat in training, and I will never forget, and I remember who said it, um, he told us all, my young class, a diplomat never offends anybody by accident. All right. We have time for one more very, very quick question, and then I'm going to close up. So you, sir, get the last question. Everyone else, I apologize. Sit down um, and be very quick, and you all be very brief, and then we're going to close up. Okay. I will do my best. I'm Steve Baden. I reside in Shaker Heights, Ohio. My question to you uh, is to each one of the panel members, and it, all it requires you to do is answer in a number from one to five, with five being most likely and zero, you're absurd. Um, taking in a, into account everything that you've been saying, all of the criticisms of the current administration, as well as many, many other things that, that have been done, it, it suggests, if not screams out, that the most happy, giddy person on the planet is Putin. With that in mind, are we, what is your, it, it suggests to me that we are living through perhaps the biggest story in modern history, if not all of mankind history, that being that the President of the United States is a compromised Manchurian candidate. Okay, we got it. And I'd like it. to know what your feeling is. Uh, from a scale of one to five, how likely that is. All right, so I'm actually going to wind it up. You can put your number in the rest of your question. I'd like to, first of all, thank the panel. Um, I'm going to start here with Hallie. Um, last comments um, about the hope for the future. You have about a minute each, and if you want to talk about The Manchurian Candidate, which is a great book and a great movie, in that response, that is your, that is your prerogative. Um, obviously, I can't answer that question for, you know, the reasons of not wanting to get fired. Um, but I will say that I, I do think it's fascinating, all this em emphasis and attention paid on Russia and Putin. Uh, but I do wish there was more attention being paid to Beijing uh, and Xi Jinping and what's going on over there. Because when you look at the future, you know, which country has more potential uh, to make changes in the world, Russia or China? I, thanks. Yeah. So... That's all I'll say about that. It's a pleasure being here. Thank you. Uh, short answer is 1.5. I don't think it's terribly likely, but I can't exclude it. Look, I, uh, I detest Vladimir Putin as much as Donald Trump envies him. Uh, but the, the, the fact is that the relationship with Russia is the most dangerous we have in the world. The relationship with China is the most important, but it is not as dangerous as the relationship with Russia. And while I don't trust this president to cut any deals with Russia, it is absolutely essential that on both a military and a diplomatic level, we open up the lines of communication to talk about ways to reduce the risk 
of accidental conflict with Russia. And that should be a high priority. Unfortunately, the president, by his own words and actions, has rendered himself impotent to hold those kinds of discussions. So we have to do it at a lower level. Um, I guess I would say uh, we're approaching a five. Um, I, I think the behavior of Trump, and, and it's right in front of your eyes, you can observe it too, is not that of an innocent man. And the Steele dossier, Mr. Steele is actually a very respected intelligence operative who has been a source for journalists and for the intelligence community with respect to Russia as well as some other places. He's not some fly-by-night crazy. And that dossier is to be taken seriously. Our intelligence community did. And then there's the money part. And we know that Russian oligarchs finance parts of the Trump enterprise. Now, does he have something to hide? He sure acts like it. So I, I, I would respectfully say it's a lot higher than 1.5. I, I think it's approaching 5, and I think that explains his behavior. Final point, I, on a hopeful note, because we're ending, i got to tell you, as somebody who runs for office, I have been so heartened by the combination of public revulsion at what is happening and non-despair. We're going to do something about it. We're getting organized. <laughs> Especially among our young people. And I think that gives us great hope moving forward. Thanks all for being here today. Thank you very much. Before we conclude, I want to thank our panelists. I want to let everybody know that the plenary session begins at 2.45 in the Regency Ballroom. Thank you so much for coming.